Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Graziella Parati. I am the director of the Humanities Center. Welcome to this day, today's presentation that promises to be very thought-provoking. And that is my agenda for this quarter, to have extremely thought-provoking uh, uh, lectures. We will have another one on February 5th. Uh, the presenter will be Professor Bruce Tutu from AAAS. No, Native American Studies. Ooh, I should know. I shouldn't make these mistakes. Uh, he will talk about the relationship between law and the voices of Native Americans throughout history. So uh, about Mark Bray. Mark Bray is a historian of human rights, terrorism, and political radicalism in modern Europe. And he did a fantastic presentation in my class last quarter, and it was a class devoted to fascism. He completed his PhD in modern European and women's and gender history at Rutgers University in 2016, and he's currently finishing his manuscript entitled The Anarchic, An Anarchist Inquisition, Terrorism and the Ethics of Modernity in Spain, 1893-1909. The Anarchist Inquisition explored the emergence of groundbreaking human rights campaigns across Europe and the Americas in response to the Spanish state's brutal repression of dissent in the wake of anarchical bombings and assassin assassinations. Um, he has begun work on his next project, which explores the cultures of violence and street resistance that emerge in the social movement of post-war Western Europe and their impact on conception of leftist masculinity in the context of the emergence of competing conceptions of feminism. Bray is, of course, the author of Antifa, the Antifascist Handbook, a bestseller here in the United States, published in 2017. And he's also the author of the book, Translating Anarchy, The Anarchism of Occupy Wall Street, published in 2013. And she's, he is also the co-author of the forthcoming Francisco Ferrer and the Modern School. It will be uh, available in 2018. I would like to thank him, for, thank him for accepting to give this lecture here at Dartmouth. And I also would like to thank Sean Delmore and Patricia McGuinn, who are the administrators at the Humanities Center. So without them, uh, nothing would happen. So thank you all, Mark. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me in the back? Great. Thank you so much to Graziella. Thank you to Patricia. Thank you to the Leslie Center for having me. And thank you all, all of you, for coming out and taking the time to actually hear what I have to say and engage with my arguments and agree and disagree and make up your own mind based on what I'm actually saying. It's really refreshing, and I appreciate it. <laughs> Today, I'm going to talk about my book, which is about uh, the Politics and History of Anti-Fascism. It's a book that I wrote faster than most historians write books, right? Historians are used to measuring the time that it takes to write a book in years. And the manuscript that's growing out of my dissertation is one such book, and that kind of arduous long-term scholarship is incredibly important and is the foundation of everything we do. But I think there's also a place for uh, scholars to insert their expertise in moments of political crisis. And so that is the genesis of this book. I call it a kind of history, politics, and theory on the run, because it was written earlier in 2017 to respond to the Trump era. So today I'm going to talk about some of the history. It's going to be a lot of it's going to be history. And in my experience, when there are alt-right trolls in the crowd, they really don't like the history part. So if you're one of those folks, you might have to bear with me a little bit here. At the end, I'm going to talk about some of the politics as they apply to current events and some of the, the greatest hits, violence, free speech, all of that. So if you're excited about that, hang in there. We'll get there. Um, this book is 
in a certain sense has become kind of an obvious topic, right? In the news, anti-fascism, the notorious Antifa are all over the headlines, but it's a little surprising, or it was very surprising to me, that there really aren't a ton of books about this subject in the post-war period, and by post-war I'm talking about post-World War II. So why is that? Well, I think part of it is, is first, that a lot of anti-fascists over the last few decades have been very concerned about sharing their stories with uh, journalists or scholars such as myself for fear of being identified by the police or identified by the far right. That's changing a little bit given current events, but that's been the sort of norm for a while, the reluctance to, to be public. I managed to write this book largely based on over 60 interviews I conducted with current and former anti-fascists from 17 different countries in Europe and North America. I managed to get these interviews in large part because I'm an activist myself, I was involved in Occupy Wall Street and other kinds of campaigns, and managed to tap into the networks that I have to talk to people who would trust that I wouldn't abuse uh, their confidence. Another reason is that I think historians have been unduly reluctant to actually look at what post-war anti-fascists have been up to, uh, and to think of it as part of to some extent, a kind of historical continuity that dates back to the early 20th century. So as a result of all of this, I was just as surprised as some of you may be to find out that actually this book is the first transnational history of post-war anti-fascism in English. Previously, there have been books written especially in English about the situation in Britain, uh, a few studies about other places, but in a post-war context, a reluctance to actually talk about a transnational movement. So that's, that's one of the main contributions that I aim to make with this book. The book is about US, Canada, and Europe because I'm a historian of European history. Those are the contacts I had to turn to, and I had to come up with some sort of manageable scope to get this book done. But anti-fascism has a global history. Just to name one of the most obvious examples, anti-fascists from around the world journeyed to Spain to fight in the international brigades in the Spanish Civil War, but there are plenty of other examples. So just a little caveat that that's my geographical focus. So what is anti-fascism? An interesting and important question. The way historians have generally talked about it is in sort of a minimalist sense of those who opposed fascism in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And that's not wrong. That's one way of looking at it. But the purpose with my book is to explain the historical roots of the Antifa that we see in the news. And they grow out of a specific tradition within anti-fascism that really crystallized itself in the post-war period. In English and Italian, it's often referred to as militant anti-fascism. In French, often referred to as radical anti-fascism. And in German, as autonomous anti-fascism. And it exists at the intersection of two related considerations, all right? So number one, it's kind of a pan-radical left politics of social revolutionary self-defense against the far right. It incorporates all different kinds of leftists in an effort to put aside that which usually divides the left in the interest of opposing what's perceived as the common enemy. There were efforts to do this before the war, didn't always work out so well. The second related consideration is that it's a strategy and politics of direct action. Uh, militant anti-fascists refuse to have faith in the state, the police, or the courts to stop the far right and argue that it's important for movements to organize from below and not just assume that the police will necessarily do their job. So when you put those two things together, militant anti-fascism is this specific tendency emerged really largely in post-war Europe, and we'll talk a little bit about why later, that's at the intersection of pan-radical left politics and direct action tactics. So that's one sort of specific way of uh, defining this phenomenon. But I think definitions have their pros and cons. And we can get so locked in on this that I think we sometimes lose the, the larger picture. So another sort of little piece that I think is important to keep in mind is, is the bigger picture. So what do I mean by that? Well, when I was writing this book and I was trying to think, what is anti-fascism? I said, all right, well, before doing that, let's think a little bit about what fascism is. As scholars who have talked about that issue know, that's a whole complicated question. I'm not going to definitively answer that tonight. But I was thinking through what Ami Césaire had to say about Nazism, which, for those of you who don't know, was that to some extent we can think of Nazism as European genocide and imperialism brought home to the European continent. Historians have also debated that question. But if for the sake of argument we take that as a point of reference and consider Nazism and fascism as one specific facet of a global history of white supremacy, genocide, and imperialism, 
then I think so too we can think of anti-fascism as one facet of resistance within that larger tradition of resisting white supremacy and fascism. So in that sense, we can date the start of anti-fascism and fascism to the early 20th century, but I think those are really facets of a larger history that has to go back to the first slave ships, to Christopher Columbus, and so forth. So important to keep both of those things in mind. Finally, before we jump into the history, for anyone who's starting to think this, I'll, I'll, I'll jump to the chase. I'm not neutral on this subject. In fact, I don't think any of us can really be neutral about white supremacy and fascism. That's a question. If you disagree, bring it up. We'll talk about it. But I, I don't pretend to be. Um, I don't think that there's any one way to resist. I'm not calling on anyone to do any one thing in particular. But I do think it is incumbent upon us to form our own ways of thinking about resisting these destructive forces. So with that, let's get into some of the history. So as I said, fascism is a difficult topic to, to discuss for a variety of reasons. Some historians have argued, Robert Paxton, for example, that in a, in a functional sense, we can think of the earliest kind of proto-fascist formation as the KKK, perhaps. If you think of it that way, then certainly anti-Klan resistance in the late 19th or early 20th centuries could be thought of as a kind of anti-fascism. Related to that, others have pointed to the anti-Semitic leagues that popped up in France around the Dreyfus Affair at the turn of the 20th century, and think of them, perhaps, as a kind of proto-fascist phenomenon, if you're sympathetic to that notion, you can see that even in that context, there was a kind of anti-fascism, most notably in the example of the Coalition Revolutionnaire, which was a, a coalition formed by anarchists and anti-parliamentary socialists, which did a lot of the things that actually anti-fascists do today. They forcibly disrupted anti-Semitic meetings. They escorted uh, Dreyfusards into court as they were testifying on behalf of the wrongfully accused uh, Jewish Captain Dreyfus. They put up propaganda around the city, torn down anti-Semitic propaganda, and so forth. But of course, when we talk about the quote unquote official fascism and anti-fascism, we might as well start here with Mussolini and his black shirts. So as many of you no doubt are aware, after World War I, in the context of a wave of revolutionary upheaval in Italy, when peasants threatened to take over the land, workers threatened to take over the factories, known as the, the two red years, Mussolini and his black shirts were empowered by the support they received from the Italian ruling class in suppressing this kind of dissent. Perhaps the most important militant formation that organized to resist them was called the Arditi del Popolo, which was essentially a pan-radical left militia that organized federally hundreds of sections, thousands of members across Italy that took up rifles and went to towns and villages to fight the black shirts. Long story short, they didn't succeed, otherwise maybe we wouldn't be having this talk tonight. Uh, but nevertheless, why they didn't succeed is interesting. There are a number of factors. One that's most interesting to talk about here is that their efforts to have a pan-radical left formation faltered. The Socialist Party withdrew support. The newly formed Communist Party withdrew support. So in the end, the only institutional support the RDT had came from the anarchist movement. If we jump over to Germany for a moment, this is an image of the Red Front Fighters League, which was a communist party paramilitary formation organized in the early 1920s, not organized as an anti-fascist formation, more organized as a kind of revolutionary militia. I'm really interested in political symbols, so I'm going to keep referring back to political symbols. You'll have to excuse me. But here we have the origin of the anti-fascist fist symbol. Um, it was originally designed not as an anti-fascist symbol so much as a communist symbol. But it's interesting to note that Hitler, when he incorporated Mussolini's fascist salute, it was a salute that was brought in to respond to this communist fist, not the other way around. Interesting to note. Over time, other German factions organized their own anti-fascist formations. Here we have the Iron Front organized by the Socialist Party. And here we have the origin of one of the more popular anti-fascist symbols, the, the downward three arrows. The, the origin or genesis of the symbols we can detect in the image in the top left, where you see the arrows crossing out a swastika. This developed out of the fact that there was a, a Russian emigre named Chakotin, or that's my best effort to pronounce his name, who was part of the Socialist Party was trying to think through a way to rebrand the Socialist Party as their poll numbers were falling. He's walking around the streets of Berlin, sees a line crossing out the swastika, imagines the line as an arrow, and imagines the single arrow as three arrows. And so there you have three arrows on the top left. You can see the arrows on the flags. Bottom left, 
carrying the three arrows. Now, this was more of an electoral project than a kind of militant project to oppose fascism. It was kind of a rebranding of, of what was essentially had become kind of a stodgy political party. When Hitler came to power, it offered very little in the way of, of opposition. But this influenced the Communist Party to create their own sort of version of an electoral, to use a, a phrase that didn't really get going until later, popular front kind of coalition in anti-fascist action. And here you can see uh, a Communist Party office in anticipation of an election in the early 1930s. And one of the other more popular images of anti-fascism, the two flags which adorn the cover of my book. These two flags were originally red, one to represent socialism, the other communism. This has been interpreted as kind of a pan-radical left show of unity. But in fact, as students of this history know, the Communist Party was really militantly opposed to the socialists. They hated the socialists even more than the, than the fascists because after 1928, the official position of the Communist International was socialists were, quote, social fascists. So this is really mostly an effort to win over the socialist rank and file to vote for the Communist Party. Nevertheless, later it was interpreted as kind of a pan-radical left image. Ultimately, when Hitler comes to power in 1933, the Communist Party creates what might be the worst slogan in the history of slogans, which is, first Hitler, then us. So what, what did they mean by that? What they essentially meant was they figured that Hitler would be just another right-wing chancellor. He would do so poorly in government that he would be out in six or nine months, and the Communist Party could ride his wave into his, his coattails into, into power. That did not happen, of course. But I think it points to an important dynamic to, to trace throughout this, which is, to a large extent, many anti-fascists of the 20s and 30s, especially in leadership positions, didn't fully take seriously the threat that fascism and Nazis imposed. There's a lot of reasons why that is, but I think that one of the reasons is that they interpreted fascism or Nazism as variants of traditional conservative right-wing politics and didn't realize that it represented something entirely new that posed an existential threat to, well, to many people. Perhaps the first time that you see really a substantive popular recognition of the threat posed by fascism might have been in Austria in 1934 when the socialists launch an uprising against a right-wing government. But in a really much bigger sense, you can probably turn to the Spanish Civil War. So I'd love to do a whole presentation on the Spanish Civil War, but we're not going to do that tonight. For now, I'll limit myself to saying a few things. One, obviously, you should start with the international brigades. Though organized under the auspices of the Communist International, it brought anti-fascists from around the world to fight against Franco and his allies in Hitler and Mussolini. At the beginning, at least on the surface, this posed the best opportunity for a really sincere pan-radical left unity against fascism. All your different left factions were at least seemingly pointing in the same direction. Ultimately, that, that unity fractured around a few main issues. On the one hand, you have the communists and their socialist allies who argue for putting aside the class struggle in the interest of pursuing the war. On the other hand, you have uh, anarchists and Trotskyists who argued that those two things were interrelated. That's my best effort to succinctly describe that what is a complicated process. Nevertheless, this is, this is a kind of attempt that people look back to in the future and ask what could have been if this had been held on to. Before jumping to the post-war period, let's talk a little bit about England. So here we have some images of the Battle of Cable Street of 1936. What was the Battle of Cable Street? Well, essentially, uh, the British Union of Fascists, which was a not especially large but the biggest fascist party in Britain at the time, was increasingly anti-Semitic as the 1930s went along. And they organized a march through the largely Jewish east end of London. Interestingly, initially, the Communist Party argued against opposing it. They called upon their members to go to a rally in support of the Spanish Republic in a different part of the city at the same time, and said that confronting the fascists would be disorderly, disruptive, uncivilized. The rank and file of the Communist Party was not too happy with this response. They pushed the leadership to change their course, and in the end, the Communist Party endorsed a counter-protest. So when the day comes, more than 100,000 anti-fascists and immigrants and Jews and, and people who didn't want fascists marching through their neighborhood showed up to forcibly prevent the fascists from marching. About 6,000 fascists showed up. 
The march wasn't even allowed to occur. The police canceled it from the beginning. And the actual battle that occurred was really more between the police and the anti-fascists than the fascists and anti-fascists. This has come to be seen as one of the most influential examples of Western European anti-fascism. And there are plenty of incidents later on that have sort of been remembered in this context. So I think that whether you agree or disagree with the anti-fascist analysis today, it's important to understand the kinds of lessons that they drew from this early history and how they inform the development of anti-fascist politics and tactics today. So I'm going to talk about a couple of kind of conclusions that they drew. One is, is post-war anti-fascists argue that fascism is dangerous even when it's small. On first glance, that might sound like kind of an obvious point, right? Fascism's not, not a good deal. But they point to a couple of things. One, even in small doses, fascists can be pretty deadly. We saw that recently with uh, the murder of Heather Heyer in Charlottesville, with the knife attack in Oregon, the murder of a young black student in Maryland, the shooting in Florida after Richard Spencer's speech, and the list goes on and on. In the immediate post-war period in London, Despite the defeat of the Axis powers, there was actually a resurgence of anti-Semitic fascist activity, 45, 46, 47. And uh, a lot of Jewish anti-fascists, many of them veterans returning from the war, had to organize a militant opposition as fascists were attempting to burn down synagogues and assault Jewish people. Now, if you look at that episode in the context of British history, some historians have said, oh, well, you know, sure, there was a little bit of a fascist resurgence after World War II, but in the, in the scope of British politics, it was really a minor phenomenon. And that's true. If you take a macro view, it was small. But if you were a Jewish person in 1947 who was afraid to walk out your front door or to go to your synagogue because it had been burned, then to you it was an impo incredibly important deal. So that's why I think it's always important with this to look at things from a macro and a micro perspective. But even more, Substantively, they point to the fact that if we swing back to, to this guy, we can see that in 1919, Mussolini's initial fascist nucleus had 100 men. Two years later, the movement had grown to 250,000. Or if you take a look at Hitler when he attended his first meeting of the German Workers' Party before the name changed to the Nazi Party, at that time, the party had 54 members. Now, most of the time, back then and today, these small groups don't get anywhere near that. But the argument that anti-fascists have drawn is you treat every small clan or neo-Nazi group as if they could be Mussolini's 100 or Hitler's 54. That's the argument that they draw. The kind of irony or the, uh, the kind of uh, paradox of it all is that when militant anti-fascists are succeeding in their goal of stopping these groups, they never reach the level of importance for anyone to care that they were stopped in the first place. If anti-fascists had stopped Hitler when he had 54 people, we would never have known what happened. That would have been pretty rad. What else? What about the question of left unity? Anti-fascists in the post-war period have argued that to the degree possible, we should try to find common ground in organizing against the far right and fascists. Clearly, that was something that did not happen the fact that the socialists and communists in Germany, for example, hated each other more than the Nazis at many times was clearly a historical tragedy. Finally, I think it's also important to recognize that Hitler and Mussolini gained power largely legally. They did not crash down the gates of power, but the, the, the gatekeepers opened the doors and let them in. Uh, they, they capitalized upon the fear of the ruling classes of Italy and Germany and took over. In that way, post-war anti-fascists have become very skeptical of what might be considered kind of a liberal formula for stopping fascism, which you can see in many of the uh, opinion pieces published around this topic today. I think it really revolves around three main pieces that they become critical of. First is faith in reason, discourse, and dialogue on its own to stop fascism. Second is faith in the police to arrest fascists when they do something illegal. And the third is faith in parliamentary government to withstand potential authoritarian attacks. So their analysis of the three, I'll try to run through succinctly. First, when it comes to discourse and reason, anti-fascists actually argue that's super important because you need to build a popular movement that can win people over who are on the fence, who are potentially sympathetic to a fascist message, 
But when we see that, that the situation calls for organizing against a political thought that rejects rationality and rejects the humanity of many people who are trying to argue with it, we can see that that may not always be enough. Certainly a lot of arguments were raised against Hitler and Mussolini back in the 20s and 30s and it wasn't sufficient. But of course, if you have an analysis of how discourse is always related to power, then discourse on its own is never enough and it's kind of a, a truism. But the police. Well, uh, anti-fascists are, are often point out the fact that police are sometimes among the most sympathetic to the allegedly return to law and order promises of fascism. Um, the FBI has investigated extensive white power infiltration into local law enforcement since the 1990s. After all, if you were an angry neo-Nazi skinhead, what kind of job would you want to get? Uh, that's not to mention, of course, the kind of structural systemic role of white supremacy in the carceral system and the criminal justice system. Finally, parliamentary politics. And this is the one that I think gets the least attention, but is, is really interesting. So you know, when Hitler centralized his power through the Enabling Act after the Reichstag fire, that Enabling Act was approved by the German Reichstag, the parliament. And in that way, you can see that parliamentary governments tend to have emergency mechanisms on the book for the centralization of power in times of perceived crisis. In that way, I think, and of course, if you also bring in a kind of class analysis of how in times of potential revolutionary upheaval, people in power might be sympathetic to authoritarian solutions, you can see how maybe parliamentary politics and fascism and authoritarianism might be more of a spectrum than a necessarily an antagonistic relationship. Whew. Let's go to the post-war period. All right. So I'm going to talk sort of mostly about Britain and Germany as two kind of threads to talk about post-war European anti-fascism. So let's start out with Britain. As I mentioned, unfortunately, the fascist threat did not disappear in the 1940s. It returned to target Jews in London and elsewhere. But moving into the 50s, 60s, and 70s, there was a shift that happened in the British far right and to varying degrees in, in, the, in the far right of other countries, which was a shift towards focusing their venom on Jews to new uh, immigrant populations from the Caribbean, South Asia, and elsewhere. So in the 1970s, the fascist National Front organizes a Keep Britain White campaign, and they organize a, a, a quote, anti-mugging march, reminiscent to some extent of the march organized by the British Union of Fascists in 1936, an anti-mugging march through an immigrant neighborhood of London. Immigrants show up, anti-fascists show up, feminists show up. They block the, the march path of the National Front in what was called the Battle of Lewisham, which uh, activists at the time likened to sort of their version of the Battle of Cable Street. And this definitively broke the ability of the National Front to intimidate this community. That organizing led to the formation of the Anti-Nazi League. They kind of reimagined the three arrows of anti-fascism that the socialists came up with in the early 30s as one or two arrows. And they also were really organizing in response to a cultural shift in the far right, where the National Front and other far right groups attempted to infiltrate the growing punk, punk and skinhead movements. So for those who don't know, skinhead culture was originally not racist. It grew out of a really interesting uh, intermixing of uh, Caribbean culture and music and British working class culture in the late 60s and early 70s. But by this point, there is a neo-Nazi skinhead variant that starts to threaten, well, all sorts of people. So the response is not just about organizing, it's also about culture and music. They organize the uh, Rock Against Racism series, which is, as it sounds, a, a, a series of concerts featuring a bunch of bands that I love, but I'm not sure if my students would know, like The Clash and The Specials and, and other bands like that. Uh, there were also Rock Against Racism concert series organized in the US and Canada, and the fascists attempted to organize their version, which they called Rock Against Communism, but the bands were not nearly as good. <laughs> that leads to the creation of anti-fascist action in 1985. Excuse me. Here we have uh, one of the periodicals of anti-fascist action, where you see the prominence of the popular anti-fascist slogan, no platform, as in no platform for fascism. And also, it's important to note that there was a significant element of IRA solidarity in 1980s British anti-fascism. 
because of the connection between British fascists and Ulster loyalists and the kind of British politics that was particular to the time. Also during this era, anti-fascists do a lot of work trying to push fascism and racism out of football or what we call soccer. So if you watch international matches today, the no racism in football kind of mantra is pretty ubiquitous, but back then it wasn't at all. And so the early kind of efforts to make that a thing came from anti-fascist circles. I interviewed an anti-fascist from Leeds who would show up at all the games with zines and, and really try to organize on a grassroots level at these games. And, and they had a lot of success with it. Okay, so that's kind of a, a British thread. Now let's jump over to a German thread. So, Part of the reason why fascist and anti-fascist politics become an issue right after World War II in Britain is because the British government had laxer laws about the expression of far-right views. You could do a lot more on the far-right in Britain than you could in continental Europe. Because out of the ashes of World War II, the governments that emerged in the East and the West to varying degrees established themselves as officially anti-fascist states and the left parties that rose to prominence in some of these countries, their solution to stopping the far right was to make the far right essentially illegal. You couldn't just organize another Nazi party in, in Germany and so forth. So that's why we're sort of jumping ahead here to the 1980s, because by the late 1980s, there is a resurgent white power skinhead movement in, in the West in Germany, but also increasingly in the East. It's kind of an interesting story how the uh, East German authorities responded to that. It shows all sorts of weird paradoxes, but I'm not gonna get into that. So you get this resurgence of white power uh, politics, and this kind of explodes with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the kind of ultra-nationalist euphoria that leads to reunification. Um, explicitly or implicitly, Nazi and fascist groups pop up. They start attacking immigrants, um, even uh, a, a, a member of the American Olympic bobsled team is assaulted. Amnesty International issues a condemnation of the German government's inactivity in responding to these attacks. And so the kind of on-the-street militant self-defense that emerged, emerged to a large extent from what were called the autonomous anti-fascists growing out of the autonomous movement in Germany. Here you have the origin of the black bloc tactic, which despite what you may read in the newspaper, is not a group, uh, it's not one discrete group of people, it's a way of engaging in militant street activities under a kind of guise of anonymity by dressing uniformly in black. Uh, so this is how many of the anti-fascists would dress when they confront the neo-Nazis. For example, in 1989, on Hitler's birthday, there was a, a Nazi demonstration in Berlin to celebrate his birthday, and they were confronted by folks like this. So that's how it kind of played out. Here they are at a demonstration to commemorate the death of an anti-fascist named Connie who died when she was running away from police and was chased out in front of a, a car. Here we have um, an anti-fascist periodical from this era. You'll notice that it was published in German and Turkish because a good number of these autonomous anti-fascists from the late 80s and early 90s were Turkish and other migrants who were organizing for their self-defense. There were some groups that were exclusively Turkish, in fact. And here we have, going back to my interest in symbols, the first example I could find of the anti-fascist flag symbol in both red and black to show the increased influence of anarchist and anti-authoritarian politics during the era. Top right, you have the old one, then you have the new one. Imagine this time as a more sincerely pan-radical left symbol, this being from December 87. Also, during this time, it was still flowing from left to right, but within a couple of years, the orientation shift from right to left, and it usually is this way now. I don't know why. All right, let's jump over to North America for a little bit. Now, as I alluded to in the beginning, but it always bears repeating, it's not as if the peoples of North America or South America were any strangers to resisting white supremacy and authoritarianism before this era. I'm just tracing one specific tendency that was influenced by the European example. So if we want to trace this European militant anti-fascist influence in North America, we should start with the creation of anti-racist action in the late 1980s. So what was the context there? Well, you have a punk scene in the US, and over time you have, once again, an increasing influence of a neo-Nazi skinhead presence. If you talk to anyone who was a punk or a skinhead in the late 80s or 90s, 
having to deal with these folks around the country was regular. It's a regular issue. So there was a group of anti-racist skinheads in Minneapolis who called themselves the Baldies, who were reading all of these uh, British punk magazines. And they started reading about anti-fascist action. They said, oh, we want to do that. But they thought that the language of, of fascism didn't quite necessarily fit in the American context. So rather than calling themselves anti-fascist action, they called themselves anti-racist action. This is the first newsletter that they published out in Minnesota back in 1988. And this is how they sort of laid out their minimalist political program at the time. Over time, it would become a bit more detailed. And they'd organize around four main principles, which I think I'm going to talk about a little bit because I think it, it fleshes out the kind of nature of the politics. All right, number one, we go where they go. So what did they mean by that? They meant that whenever there was a far right demonstration, it was important to have a counter demonstration. That may look like different things in different times and places, but it was an argument for always having a counter voice. Number two is we don't turn to the state, the police, or the courts to stop the far right. Some, and then they had a little caveat, sometimes that's useful, but then that's not our main focus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's, of course, a hallmark of, a hallmark of militant anti-fascism. Um, number three was that they had a defense of reproductive rights, which shows that their conception of anti-fascism was, was fairly broad. They'd go into high schools to talk to students. They'd show up at abortion clinics to defend reproductive rights. Uh, they'd organize concerts. Anti-racist action went on tour with the Mighty Mighty Boston's in the 90s. If you're old enough to remember them, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, and then finally was, what was the other one? Oh, non-sectarian defense of all anti-fascists. So an argument that, yeah, we have our differences, but let's get on the same page. And that goes to show you that, sure, there's a very specific politics to this, but it's also very open-ended. And it's out of this tendency, this anti-racist action network, that we see the derivation of the kind of Antifa that you see in the news today. So the anti-racist action network peaked in the 1990s. It had hundreds of chapters around the country and thousands of members, also in Canada and even a little in Latin America. Um, these folks went to a few actually international congresses in Europe where they met with anti-fascists over there. Into the 2000s, it declined and led to what is now called the Torch Network, which groups about a dozen groups in the US. There's a bit of a shift in terms of the kind of language and symbolism of American anti-fascism starting around 2007. That year, the, the oldest currently existing group was formed in Portland, Oregon. They're called Rose City Antifa, and they started using the really German language of Antifa and the flags and arrows, which we saw a little while ago. Because if you look at anti-racist action periodicals from the 90s, none of these European symbols show up. A lot of them are fists punching swastikas or like adaptations of Calvin, Calvin and Hobbes imagery. So, from the 2007 onward, there's a greater acknowledgement, probably facilitated over time through social media, of the European model. And that's where you get the language of Antifa becoming more common than the language of anti-racist action. Now, most Americans hadn't heard of this at all. Uh, this started to be something that was known perhaps a little bit when the uh, white supremacist Richard Spencer was punched in Washington, DC on Inauguration Day. Certainly much more when Milo Yiannopoulos had his scheduled event at U the University of California, Berkeley, shut down in February 2017. But of course, the incident in Charlottesville, uh, the counter-protest against the Unite the Right demonstration, and especially the subsequent murder of Heather Heyer, put this question on the map. Um, so I'm not going to get too much into the current events politics. If people want to ask stuff, we can do that. Before I wrap up my sort of formal part of this, I'm going to say a few things about free speech, a few things about questions of tactics and violence, and then we'll have at it. So free speech. If you're really interested in this question in relation to anti-fascism, I have copies of my book over here. They're $15, <laughs> and I wrote a whole chapter about questions of free speech. Um, so I'm not going to get into all of it. I'll just touch upon a few things now. Um, one is that I think being a historian, my tendency is always to look at every phenomenon in its context. So when I wrote this book, I had a number of people read it and give me feedback. One of them was an Austrian who read it and said, why do you have so much about free speech? This is not really an important issue to this topic. So it just goes to show you that we should always remember that as Americans, we view it through a certain lens. That having been said, I asked every one of my 60 plus interview subjects what they thought about this issue. I got two main kinds of answers. 
So all is to say there is diversity. One answer is to say that no anti-fascists are not against freedom of speech because freedom of speech as a constitutional protection refers to what the government does. We're not the government. We're not aiming to censor anyone. We're not calling on the government to pass any laws. We're just trying to organize against organized white supremacists and fascist groups. They often distinguish between groups and individuals. One person from uh, Indiana said, you know, if I have a coworker who's spouting out some racist stuff, I'll try to talk to him. I'm not going to apply the same kinds of tactics that I would to a neo-Nazi skinhead outfit that's trying to organize. That's one way of viewing it. The other way of viewing it is to say, no free speech for fascists, next question. So the degree to which people answered one way or the other had everything to do with where they were from. So I spoke to some Greek anti-fascist who said, we understand in Greece you fight the fascists. The question's irrelevant from their perspective. He said that's a very American consideration. On the other hand, in the US, in Britain, and increasingly in the Netherlands, it was, it was an issue that people paid a lot of attention to. But what kind of unites the perspectives, though, I would say, is a shared rejection of the liberal terms of debate, which would have us assess what anti-fascists view as a life and death struggle against an opponent that wants to promote genocide and not subsume that within kind of a liberal rights framework, a difference of opinion to be sort of pleasantly discussed. That's kind of one of the major differences. Um, my own, just sort of to insert my own two cents into it, I was really, uh, I really like the article that the NYU Vice Provost Ulrich Bayer wrote uh, in the New York Times called What Snowflakes Get Right About Free Speech. And his argument, clearly influenced by what is essentially the predominant view in continental Europe on these matters, is that if you had people in a community who were trying to dehumanize and intimidate other people, it doesn't actually promote a meaningful and substantive exchange of ideas in a, a sphere. And I think part of that points to differences in how we understand rights. So for example, there have been debates over the meaning of classically liberal notions of rights dating from the Enlightenment, that when we talk, for example, about class or economics or property, talking about us all being equal in a capitalist society, socialists have pointed out, is insufficient. We can't just talk about rights in the abstract, but also in a material lived reality. And I think that that also applies to questions of speech. So we shouldn't just ask the question, in a perfunctory, legalistic sense, can everyone open their mouths, but actually look at what that means in practice. That's my two cents. Finally, on questions of tactics and strategy and violence. So what do anti-fascists think about those questions? Well, first, they see anti-fascism as an activity of self-defense. If you look at the history of anti-fascist movements, when they've risen and fallen, it's almost always been in response to far-right organizing. If you interview someone from an anti-fascist group in Lyon or in Berlin and say, when did your group form? Oh, it formed in 2011. Why did it form? Well, because there was this local right, far-right formation who was trying to organize against the local Muslim community, et cetera, et cetera. OK, when did your group end? It ended in 2016. Why is that? Well, that group just became inactive, and we shifted our time towards labor organizing or community organizing or anti-eviction organizing. So what this points to me is that it's, it's a politics of self-defense. That having been said, though, anti-fascists have sort of two different understandings of what that means. One is the more straightforward, commonly understood sense of self-defense in an immediate kind of responding to an imminent attack. And that has been the sort of predominant context in which most anti-fascist confrontation has occurred throughout history, both in the 20s and 30s. There would never have been an anti-fascism if there weren't fascism, and more recently. In the US, we can see that many of the anti-fascist groups that exist were formed in 2015, 2016, 2017 in response to what they perceived as the growth of the alt-right. That having been said, though, they also often argue for a conception of self-defense that includes what I call preemptive self-defense. On the face of it, that sounds ridiculous and paradoxical. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is essentially the question of whether we see the likelihood of fascist or white supremacist organizing producing violence as a question mark or as a given. So anti-fascists argue it's not a question of if these people will be violent, but when. They look at the history of fascist and white supremacist organizing and say it's only a matter of time before the violence comes, so we're not going to wait for them to show up at our doors with baseball bats before we act to shut them down. That having been said, though, if you look at what these folks are saying, they, they usually describe confrontation as kind of a last resort. 95% of what they do doesn't involve it at all. They monitor far right. 
they figure out who groups are, who their members are, who their leaders are. They track them across multiple social media platforms, figuring out where they're trying to hold secret events. They organize boycotts against hotels or VFWs or concert halls to shut them down. They try to organize popular coalitions to pressure cities to not give them permits to set up. And then when all of that fails, they'll consider forcibly shutting down a Klan rally. So in that sense, then they don't shy away from that element, but it should be understood as one part of a larger tactical repertoire and often one that emerges when the others have failed. Finally, before I wrap up, I also want to draw attention to the fact that there are multiple different ways that anti-fascist politics can play themselves out, despite the fact that the media focuses on one aspect. So in addition to being one of the main voices talking about this in the press by default. Uh, journalists have been really interested to try to get interviews with people who are part of these groups. So I act as sort of a facilitator to, to pass on interview requests. But they're really only interested in folks that engage in the kind of militant confrontational activities that we're talking about. When I try to say, hey, there's this other group that's actually thinking of anti-fascism through a union organizing context, they're like, yeah, I'm good. They're interested in masks, they're interested in confrontation, they're interested in masks, they're interested in confrontation. So to remedy that, I'm gonna just say a few things about a broader conception of what anti-fascist organizing can look like. This I sort of got especially from examples in Spain and France over the last couple of years where they've organized what they call popular neighborhood anti-fascist assemblies that have grown out of, in the Spanish case, for example, the 15M movement, which was our Occupy is our version of their 15M, not the other way around. And these kinds of assemblies have kind of a, a view of bringing in community members and labor organizers and all sorts of people to organize against efforts by the far right to disseminate their politics in their community. So in the context of Madrid, for example, this took most notable form with the growth of Hogar Social, um, which is sort of a fascist group modeled on the Casa Pound in Italy. They try to mimic some forms of left organizing like um, giving out free food but only to ethnic Spaniards, even organizing eviction defense but only to protect those who are going to be evicted who are ethnic Spaniards. And so these kind of neighborhood assemblies emerge as a way for everyday people to organize in their communities and say, not in our name. And in that way, I think it points to the fact that we can think of anti-fascism as this specific kind of current organized around certain circumstances or as kind of a broader commonsensical response and this was put forward to me most clearly in, in remarks made to me by an anti-fascist from Carabanchel, which is an outlying neighborhood of Madrid named uh, Daniel. And he said, in his opinion, there are two faces of anti-fascism and we must never forget either face. For him, the one face was that which aims to short circuit the organizing of the far right, prevent them from being able to do the things that are necessary to grow, have demonstrations, disseminate their message, become a, a fixture of the community. So sort of a defensive posture. The other, as he saw it, was that which tries to inoculate society against the appeals of fascism. To make it when there's an economic depression, people don't blame immigrants, they turn to organize with their coworkers and their neighbors. And in that way, aims to make anti-fascism not a specialty, specialty activity, but just a natural response to a threat. So in that way, I think that um, we can see that regardless of our take on how to organize against these people, uh, the Italian slogan, siamo tutti antifascisti, that we're all anti-fascist is to some extent or another true, or at least, fingers crossed, I've had a few presentations where it hasn't been true, but I hope it's true tonight. So uh, with that, uh, I'm gonna open it up to your questions, queries, comments, and criticisms. Thank you. We have certainly time for questions and answers. So thank you, Mark. And uh, I would ask you to do two things. One is don't ask the question without the microphone because the whole thing is being recorded. If, if you ask a question without the microphone, your question is now recorded. And the second one is I invite you to keep the conversation civil even though you uh, strongly disagree with what has been said. So questions. I'm going to go first here. On the other side, there is Charlotte, who will hand over the, uh, the microphone. We can start with her, absolutely. Hi. Hello. Thank you. The presentation was very interesting. Um, I was wondering if you could just speak a bit on gender in terms yes. of the Antifa, because sure. 
obviously a lot of your research has been on that area. So great you question. Can off great question. We'll do. Thank you. So if you look at why leftists in the 20s and 30s opposed fascism, it, it, it was largely around the question of, of, of um, what they perceived to be fascism as the kind of bodyguards of the capitalist state. It was very, what we might call now, kind of class reductionist in the analysis. Uh, there are exceptions, but I think that's sort of a, a dominant trend, not only when it comes to anti-fascism, but the left in general. Subsequently, there have been some efforts among anti-fascists to try to critique fascism in a more holistic kind of way. That has not proceeded always very evenly. So I'll take a few examples. So I spoke to, I mentioned before, I spoke to an anti-fascist from Leeds who was active in the 80s and 90s around organizing against fascism in football. And he said that the, basically the gendered division of labor in his group was that the women would research where the fascists were, what they were doing, while the guys hung out in the pub drinking until it was time to confront them. So that's pretty clear cut. Um, similar stories popped up elsewhere in the 80s and 90s around that kind of thing. In response to that, though, there were some interesting initiatives to try to address that issue. So for example, in Germany, there were the creation of what were called uh, feminist Antifa groups, or Fantifa, so Antifa with an F. And clearly, if that was something that people did, there was a need to do it, right? No surprise there. Today, there are Fantifa groups in Germany and Austria. And that's one of the things in this that I was most intrigued with. There's actually a book written in German just about Fantifa. Regrettably, I don't read German. But if you do, you should read it. Related to that is I spoke to some Swedish anti-fascists who explained that by the late 90s, there were gender-based discussion groups in a lot of the anti-fascist action uh, groups around the country where they discuss patriarchal behavior and how to address it. So it seems like, to a large extent, the degree to which it's been an issue that's addressed has to do with the degree to which it's been addressed in the broader left of a, of a, diff, of a diff, uh, given country. And so that's been kind of uneven. Um, Ultimately, I think that it's kind of hard for me to even really say too much definitively because for anyone who's been part of an activist group, you know that people can say one thing about gender relations in a group outwardly and the reality can be otherwise in, in, in practice. Um, that having been said, there are, like for example, um, in Madrid, there was this uh, mass march in 2015 called Madrid for All where they took the anti-fascist flags logo and made them pink and purple to emphasize the kind of feminist and queer liberation aspects of what they were doing and to get away from what might be rightly perceived as kind of a macho posture. Um, I've gotten the impression that in the US today, a lot of Antifa organizing is disproportionately queer and trans, that that's a really important central issue in what a lot of these groups are doing. Um, beyond that, it's hard for me to really say. You know, it's certainly, um, it's certainly been an issue, and I don't have any definitive answers, but those are some thoughts. So thank you for that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. So um, I was wondering, you had mentioned that a lot of anti-fascist groups will try and civilly shut down uh, fascist speakers and fascist groups. What would you say in the circumstance where kind of violence meets violence, and mm -hmm. then the optics of it are, well, these anti-fascist groups are no better than the ones they're protesting? That's a great question, right? Because that's how a lot of the media has covered it, right? Which is to interpret what anti-fascists do as being inherently fascist, and therefore sort of this kind of spy versus spy irony, right? Um, so I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about why I think that is, and then sort of how, what to do about it. So why is that? Well, I think part of it, if you want to kind of get a little meta for a moment, is how we understand fascism and Nazism in this country as, and through largely an individualistic perspective, as kind of a moral failing, not as a political system or, or kind of a, an ideology. And so in that way, you get your soup Nazi or your grammar Nazi. So it's like when people are being jerks, or being rude or uncivil, they're being Nazis. So then that's part of it. The other is to understand, there's a common tendency to understand fascism in terms of the illiberal strategic repertoire. So shutting down political meetings and so forth without also thinking of it as ultra-nationalist and misogynist and so forth and so on, all the things that differ from an anti-fascist perspective. So that's why, one, I think you can't just reduce any politics to a few facets of what it is, and two, um, you can never assess any kind of political action in the absence of why it was done and in what context. Now, what to do about that, some people have argued, well, considering the optics of it, you don't 
engage in those kinds of actions. So there are some anti-fascist formations who don't wear masks or dress in black or do that kind of stuff and do other kind of work. Right, so there's different perspectives, uh, for the, but for the people who do that kind of work, I think it's important to understand the kind of historical trajectory that it grew out of. So if we go back, for example, here to the autonomous movement in Germany, it essentially grew out of a rejection of what they perceived in the 80s to be kind of your over-bureaucratized, gigantic Stalinist or social democratic political party apparatus, a shift towards what they call the kind of prefigurative politics of organizing on a small scale. And so in that sense, these folks just didn't care what the optics were. If they shut down the fascists, they were fine, even if the rest of society was wringing their hands. And that's a perspective that exists in some circles today. And you can take it for what it is, but that's one perspective. And the other is to say that um, even in Charlottesville, for example, um, that was a situation when I think at least a willingness to humor the notion that these kinds of things can be useful was promoted in part because clergy like Cornell West and others said that anti-fascists saved their lives and because of an, an, a recognition of the threat. Because I think that if you really take seriously the notion that if we're not vigilant, this could happen again, then I think it just shifts the terms of the debate regardless of what conclusions you come to. So a few thoughts, thanks. Hi, um, great presentation. Thank I'm you just, for coming. You're, you're saying, what's that? Oh, I have to stand up? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm just curious, you, your last statement was, should it become more dangerous? Maybe, you know, should fascism then lead to a fascist government? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's arguments that were already there. And I'm wondering, you know, in terms of deportations, in terms of these raids, you can easily see that as a, as a fascist action, mm -hmm. but it's by the government. Yeah. So how does Antifa feel, or just from your interviews, about oh, intervening not just against fascist groups, but government actions that they perceive right. as fascist? Great question. Now we're getting to some next level stuff here. So one thing to understand is that um, despite the media portrayal of anti-fascism or Occupy Wall Street or Black Lives Matter as this one little box where the people who are part of it are just part of that, people who are part of politics know that people participate in all sorts of movements and campaigns and, and activities. So, no one that I interviewed for this book only did anti-fascist work. Some of them also did anti-deportation work or anti-war work or what have you. So in that way, there's, I've gotten this critique that anti-fascism is a framework that doesn't work for this or that or this. Well, of course it doesn't. It's, it's a tool for one specific kind of politics for resisting small and emergent and sort of mid-sized fascist and white supremacist groups. In chapter three, I talk about some of the limitations that Europeans are talking about in terms of confronting quote unquote respectable far right parties like the Front National in France. And it's caused a real rethinking of how to do that because you can't apply the same tactics to all political problems. This is one tool in the toolbox that even people who are actively involved with it argue has its time and its place. So sure, we should be organizing against deportations and these kinds of governmental actions. I think that my own kind of take is that there's sort of a broader kind of direct action politics that exists in various different forms that could be useful in that. Anti-fascism is one facet of that, but you can't just apply it to everything. So once we're there, we're talking about, I think, a slightly different conversation. There's some overlapping elements, but there's no one size fits all in politics. So thank you. So um, you know, very interesting talk. I enjoyed thank it. You. Last time I was here was actually in 2008 when Robert Spencer of Tiad uh, watch spoke here mm -hmm. peacefully. Um, violence is violence, you know. Uh, it's detestable that people get hit by cars in Charlottesville. It's also detestable that left wingers um, may shoot a congressman like Steve Scalise at a baseball game in Arlington, Virginia, Alexandria, Virginia. Um, I think I reject your uh, background supposition that our violence is better than the others' violence because they're bad people. People are people. How do you feel people about are, an people. imam in Tennessee who says Jews are the sons of apes and pigs and they all need to be killed? That's I a disagree. little bit of that's a little bit of terror which maybe should be stopped. But I don't think Antifa cares about that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so, is all violence equally morally uh, equivalent? I don't know anyone who thinks that all violence is equally morally equivalent unless you are some sort of an absolutist pacifist who also, of course, rejects the police and the military violence, right? 
So if you have that position, great. But if you don't, then we do need to adjudicate which kinds of violence are justifiable and which kinds of circumstances. Um, I think it's always useful when we talk about the question of anti-fascism to start from the kind of most egregious manifestations of what the fascist threat has meant. So in the 20th century, certainly the Holocaust. People will discuss, was it legitimate for the victims of the Holocaust to take up armed resistance against the Nazis? Many people would be sympathetic to that. OK, well, if you are, then was it legitimate to take up arms against the Nazis before the final solution had been put into place while they were in power or while they were an ascendant political party? There's no right or wrong to this per se, but, you, but I think if you're willing to countenance armed self-defense against the Nazis in the 30s and 40s, you have to figure out when, under what circumstances, it's legitimate. Anti-fascists have their answer to it. Their answer is you don't let it take even the first step. You can agree or disagree with that, but that's their framework. As a sort of background comment, though, I would say, though, that uh, violence is not violence. It depends on the context, because everything depends on the context. What about Islam? I don't like that either. Yeah, I'm, I'm not in favor of anti-Semitism. who fought with violence against fascism uh, at the end of World War II, they were uh, the heroes of the new democratic system in Italy. So in that particular context, the violence of the fascists was considered by the whole country itself and by the political structures that were created after World War II as the bad violence. And then the violence that was employed by the white and red anti-fascism, in part also financed and helped by the allies, including the United States, as that kind of violence that allowed for the construction of democracy uh, within the country. So it's a huge, uh, thank you for your question, because it's really a huge topic, uh, that the use of violence vis-a-vis fascism, and, and I'm sure we have other questions. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I want to add the question about a point, I guess. The, the output from uh, your book and was the- Could you speak up? I couldn't oh, quite hear you, sorry. Um, in your book, there is this outlook of this transnational analysis of the modes of expression of, um, of anti-fascism and you've looked at it as a historical analysis from like starting like the 1910s, like from a long time ago. And there's a thing, I guess, that pops up maybe more in more North American context, but has spread out in, like, for example, New York, and like, if you had like the French fascial sphere, like, there's this idea of new modes of expression of like, uh, fascistic to fascist tendencies from the spectrum from like the alt light to like, the extreme like, white nationalist, like, the most extreme tendencies like a new mode that is informed by mass media, by social media, by internet, which in some like media representations has been like in, looked at, I guess, with some interest because it's like fresh, it has uh, like youth content, yep. it mm -hmm. has memes, yep. it has, it's like new mode. Do you, in your, from your historiographical point of view, do you think that it, this is something completely new that like, upsets many things of how we understand like how potential fascism could start out, or do you think that there's some mitigation to do and like some contextualization? And thank you. Sure, sure, yeah, great question. Thank you. Well, I mean, uh, so m I'll try to, to summarize, and you let me know if I'm missing out anything important. So if you look at like the development of the alt right today, its reliance on a kind of mo millennial aesthetic, the use of social media. Is there sort of a continuity with earlier forms of media innovation in the far right, or is this something new, or how to parse that? Is that kind of the gist? OK. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if you look at, um, from, a, from a big picture sense, the development of fascism is an attempt to try to sort of use mass politics, mass media, new forms of technology to paradoxically return to what are perceived as organic, eternal, traditional values. And so certainly newspapers and radio are hugely important in that in the early 20th century, and fascism does manage to develop a kind of youth appeal um, in this er era as well. So you know, there's some technological youth aspects that can kind of be sort of traced within that. 
Um, also is, of course, connecting it to the post-war re continual reinvention of far-right politics in Europe and North America, where when terms like fascist or Nazi are largely discredited, far-right formations like the French New Right have come up with new ways to think of their politics to try and sort of essentially infiltrate um, left and liberal notions of equality. So for example, if there can be black power, why not white power? If there can be national liberation in the global south, why not white liberation in Europe? Um, as a way of sort of reframing white supremacist politics and the, the language of white nationalism, which of course posits white people as one nation among many, equally deserving of respect allegedly, is one way to sort of rebrand that. Um, and so the alt-right's another to try to present white supremacist politics as being you know, quote unquote respectable, middle class, educated, wear khakis instead of hoods. You have the Tiki Torch March in Charlottesville. And one of the kind of encouraging outcomes of Charlottesville, I think, is that people were forced to really tear the veil off of that. Um, the, the notion that this could hide the true underlying politics. And you see that sometimes in media and CNN leading up to it, they'd have an issue and they say, okay, this person thinks this, this person thinks that, this alt-right person thinks that and thereby include the perspective as sort of part of the panorama of American politics, I think subsequently that's much less possible. And therefore, the intention of the alt-right language, I think, has been damaged, hopefully, permanently. So. We have a okay. uh, I have two quick questions. Sure. Well, one quick question and one less quick question. Um, one, obviously, in the numbers of Antifa grown in the last year or so, given everything that's happened. Um, I just want to get a sense of, from you, what those kinds of numbers and membership are and mm -hmm. that sort of thing, because I suspect they might be inflated in the media a little sure. bit. Um, and the second question is, I'd love for you to respond to the argument that um, kind of the expansion of Antifa and all the media attention and, and this kind of thing, there have been a lot of um, eloquent arguments that they're going to make fascists more violent. You know, you get kind of Good this question. tit for tat how much is that true? How much is it used in their propaganda? How much has it been used in their propaganda before? And increasingly so now, does it make a difference? Sure, all right, so the first question as far as numbers, um, the easy short answer is I don't know. Um, in part because it's not as if these groups have membership lists that are public. You know, I might speak to one or two members of a group. I don't know if they're six or 16 or what have you. But yeah, the numbers are small. <laughs> in part because it takes quite a bit of a time commitment to be part of one of these groups. Some of the people I spoke to likened it to being the time commitment of like a second job. Uh, you know, you come home from work and you spend hours pouring through the most reprehensible message boards that exist on the internet. And there's a so usually kind of a stringent vetting process. So the media that thinks that like everyone who came out to protest the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville is Antifa is not true, it's a small fraction people from all sorts of political tendencies are doing it. And of course, in so doing, they're missing the kind of interesting growth of broader anti-racist formations that include people from all sorts of tendencies. So I don't know, but it's small, right? Um, second, as far as the question about does anti-fascist confrontation promote fascist violence? Um, I don't know if fascists need an excuse to be violent. I think it's pretty much hard baked into what fascism and white supremacy is about. It's, it's a politics of violence. More concerning for me would be if the left disarmed itself in the sense of not being ready for self-defense. That's my opinion. So. Maybe we can take two more questions and then... Uh, sure. Well, we just yeah. leave. More questions? Yes. Pass the mic. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I have some difficulty trying to figure out whether the president is a fascist or just a jackass. Okay. Uh, I, I, I understand that if you define a person by his actions that maybe it doesn't matter. But it, it seems to bear on whether we should be trying to replace the president or, or just trying to survive the president. Okay. Do you have a feeling about that? Or what's the... Sure. Um, so... No, I don't think that Donald Trump is a fascist because I don't think he has a real political center of gravity. I think he goes where he feels like it's useful for him. 
That having been said, I think he's certainly created space to empower authoritarian white supremacist and fascistic tendencies. That's, that's been pretty self-evident. I'm not actually someone who thinks that fascism necessarily is even a coherent ideology to begin with. But if it is, I don't think that he holds that, that view. As far as what to do about it, um, I, I, do, I am more sympathetic to the notion that whether we have President Trump or President Pence, most of the same problems will exist. If Trump gets impeached, you know, I'll, I'll drink to that. But I don't think that that's the be all and end all of, of resistance. I think we need to look at it more substantively. So, yeah. uh, one more. Yeah, okay, I mean, so, I mean, all right, so, so a question before about deportations. Um, you know, Pres President Obama set the record for most deportations, which is not to say that Obama is the same as Trump, but the problem with deportations persists seemingly wh wh whoever we have in office. So being able to organize an anti-immigrant, pro-immigrant movement is incredibly important, coming up with ways to stop these deportations and to promote the notion that no human is illegal, right? That's one example. Um, you know, covert drone warfare around the world, uh, the, the reduction of civil liberties, mass surveillance. These are things that sort of exist regardless of the last couple of administrations and need to be targeted as such, uh, which is not to say that it's all the same. But I think that any kind of political argument needs to have those underlying issues in mind. Last question. that, I guess, That's cool. um, but uh, not about Trump necessarily, but I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to um, how, you, in looking, and maybe this is just specific to the US context, but in looking from like where you said it sort of kicked off in the 80s, right, um, to with Trump coming into, pow in, into power, if there's been sort of in fascist, and then I guess also anti-fascist groups sort of a different way of looking at the government, I guess, in terms of, you know, so you see now, like, there's efforts to, or there's maybe a legitimization of uh, whether it's running for office in sort of fascist-like networks. And so if you could comment on that, if, if there's been sort of, like, different tactics and strategies, or does that make sense? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, there's been much written about the degree to which the alt-right played an important role in getting Trump elected. Um, also, another part of it is, you know, a key part of the kind of anti-fascist analysis is it could get much worse. It's bad, but it could get much worse, right? So part of the problem, obviously, in the 20s for a lot of anti-fascists was to assume that it couldn't really get much worse than your traditional kind of right-wing um, regime. It did get much worse. It could get much worse. So part of the anti-fascist argument is to try and stop the growth of this explicitly white supremacist politics before it has direct access to the halls of power. And with Steve Bannon and, and, and um, Stephen Miller and Sebastian Gorka, there was some blurring of that. And that was certainly, obviously, a kind of facet of the concern and the politics that was, that was relevant to it. Um, and also is to say that a lot of these folks are doing other kinds of work addressing these other kinds of issues. And so you can't no platform the US government. right? It doesn't make any sense. right? So in that sense, really what we're talking about here is what some anti-fascists refer to as a firefighting operation against one of the most obvious, explicit, egregious forms of structural systemic issues that are much wider. And when you start talking about organizing against fascistic or authoritarian tendencies of the state, the politics sort of have to shift. And they're related, but they're distinct. So that's why I really try to be clear that what we're talking about here tonight is really like one little pinprick in a larger mosaic of politics. So all right. Thank so you. thank you everybody for coming tonight. I hope to see you on February 5th. Um, and we have books, $15. I'll, I'll, I'll say that at 12.30 <laughs> uh, in, at the Humanities Center, room 246 with Bruce Duthu. Uh, please, the books are here. And I think that Mark could be convinced to sign a copy if you want to get one. But thank you all for your important questions, and thank you all for coming. Thank you, Charlotte. Right.